and if are in listen only mode. Hello, my name is Julie Cummings and I'm a senior consultant with the advisory board company. I have the pleasure of monitoring today's session on leveraging analytics to mitigate financial risks in ICD-10 with Deborah Szymanski and Dr. Steve Ross. We've posted the slides on our website and you can also find the link in the GoToWebinar chat box. All you have to do is click on the link and it will take you right there. We have a few upcoming events I wanted to make you aware of. First is we have registration for our inaugural HERE Women's Conference to be held on November 11th. The conference will be in Nashville and more information regarding the agenda can be found at tnhfma.org forward slash HERE. Registration for this year's Fall Institute, October 22nd to, through the 24th is open. Come join us in Gatlinburg. More information can be found at thefallinstitute.org. Finally, Tennessee HFMA is co-sponsoring a healthcare conference with the Tennessee Society of CPAs on December 1st and 2nd. Registration is open for this two-day event in Nashville and visit tscpa.com for more information. As a reminder, if you are interested in obtaining your CPE certi certificate, you have to be connected to the webinar for at least 90% of the duration of the webinar, and you have to respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Deborah Szymanski began her career in healthcare as an emergency department nurse at the University of Colorado Hospital in Denver. After nine years in the ED as a nurse and nursing instructor, Deborah joined PICUS, now Optum, in 2009. At PICUS, Deborah worked with the professional services team implementing EMRs and outpatient revenue management software. In 2013, Deborah joined Health Language, HLI, and is a revenue cycle solution specialist focusing on ICD-9 to ICD-10 remediation. Dr. Steve Ross is a physician informaticist who joined Health Language, HLI, in 2012. He has over 10 years of experience in the development, implementation, and research of medical informatics projects at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. In addition to his work at Health Language, Dr. Ross continues to practice ambulatory internal medicine as associate clinical professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine. I'd now like to turn the um, webinar over to our two presenters. Good day. Thank you all for joining us. Deborah and Steve will be leading most of our discussion today. My name is Chris Cummins and I am the local Tennessee rep for Health Language based in Nashville and also a member of the Tennessee HFMA. So thank you again for taking the time today. Our agenda today is what I feel is a fresh and updated approach to ICD-10 and its potential impact on you and your organization. We'll take some time to give a brief updated overview of I-10, look at some financial analytics and its potential impact, show some specific examples of doing some detailed financial analytics, as well as focus on clinical analytics and then summarize our findings. Thank you again for joining us today. Steve? Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, this is uh, Steve Ross, and I'm going to start off today's presentation just by doing a level set on ICD-10. As Chris mentioned, uh, I think that we see uh, ICD-10 remediation not as uh, necessarily just uh, useful in itself, but useful as part of a general um, clinical documentation integrity program that can benefit your financial analytics and your clinical analytics. Um, so just as a level set, um, as everyone knows, there's, uh, we had a delay again in ICD-10 implementation, so the, the so-called doc fix um, had uh, stuck to it, a delay for an ICD-10 implementation until October 1st of next year rather than just uh, uh, 13 days ago. Um, even so, um, in terms of surveys of providers, uh, the vast majority of providers um, definitely say, say that they're going to have a big impact on their revenue in moving to ICD-10. Even though in general it's supposed to be revenue neutral, absolutely there can be a big impact um, uh, in the, for each individual organization. And because of that, the majority of organizations quite properly have decided to move forward with, you know, even when the delay was announced, 
they've been decided to move forward with their ICD-10 remediation project. So we definitely support that. It's definitely no time to, to lose or procrastinate. Um, in terms of, the, of what to expect and when submitting claims under ICD-10, even though we've got a little more breathing room in terms of repairing, it's likely that there's still going to be an increase in claims error rates compared with ICD-9 as everybody gets used to it, as everybody gets used to the documentation and, and coding requirements associated with ICD-10. And there's a nice report from the HIMSS G7 group on a playbook for, for ICD-10 remediation. Um, you know, depending on your perspective, these uh, payments uh, you know, uh, can be a problem either way. So if you're a, a health care um, uh, provider of, of health care, you want to make sure you're maximizing your payments. So underpayments are quite a, a problem. Of course, if you're a health plan, uh, overpayments are a problem. So both are actively engaged in, in I-10 remediation. So the big impact, of course, is, is that you know, if you're not prepared and you do suffer a decrease in cash flow and loss of revenue, obviously that's, that's going to be the major problem for your organization that you're trying to avoid that risk. So what should we do now? Well, as I've mentioned, and I think a theme that you'll see throughout this project is that um, it's, it's full steam ahead even with the delay, and it's going to have a lot of benefits. Um, even if even if ICD-10, gosh forbid, you know, got delayed further, it's going to have a lot of benefits for you. So um, realize the benefits of improving your documentation. If you improve it in 10, you're going to improve it in 9 as well. Um, you'll have a benefit in financial analytics because basically more precise coding is going to be your friend in financial analytics. And as well, um, now, well, in terms of financial analytics, making sure that you have an appropriate case mix index, that you've appropriately got all the right complication codes, et cetera. And then it's also going to be important in terms of the more precisely that you have documentation in the clinical realm, the better you can uh, direct care as well. And that's what we mean by the meaningful use. If you can get a more precise code um, um, in SNOMED representations as well, so for problem list entries, and a lot of times those are very much linked to billing diagnoses. Um, it's going to have a, a major benefit um, and also uh, impact your quality measures. So meaningful use is certainly not delayed. We're moving ahead with that. And um, we're going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about, um, well, after I do my finish my level set, how, uh, how we're going to benefit you on multiple levels by doing this. So again, just to, to finish off the level set, a lot of you are familiar with ICD-9, ICD-10, and SNOMED. Of course, ICD-9 to ICD-10 is what happens in October of next year. SNOMED is how problem list entries um, have to be captured for meaningful use, and they have important differences. As you see in the first example, sometimes they're very similar across each of the um, different terminology spaces. So how you would document COPD is not all that much different. Um, some interesting things, ICD-9 in some cases has granularity, ICD-10 doesn't. So uh, in ICD-9, um, there was a distinction between different types of hypertension with essential hypertension standing out. Actually, ICD-10 is less granular when it comes to hypertension and it maps to a, a, an appropriate SNOMED CT code. Um, there are other cases, however, where I, and, and that most people are familiar with, where ICD-10 demands more specificity. And I'll, I'll show you that last example particularly. In intrinsic asthma, uh, we've now got to document uh, in ICD-10 whether it's mild persistent, moderate uh, persistent, uh, mild intermittent, et cetera. Why is that? Well, we know from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines that care should be directed depending on what severity it is. So it's really important to document that severity so you can see if they're getting the appropriate care. And SNOMED does maintain those distinctions as well. So um, SNOMED and 10 uh, work very well together. ICD-9 didn't have the granularity we want. What I didn't show here because of its, how length would be the ones you're probably familiar with with orthopedic codes where there's a lot of specificity that regards which encounter uh, a patient is showing up for their care. And that's neither captured in ICD-9 nor in SNOMED. And sometimes you'll have ICD-9 codes that will map to, um, you know, 50 ICD-10 codes. Um, and so um, that's where ICD-10 really stands out in, uh, in relation to ICD-9 and SNOMED. So that's ICD-9-CM uh, 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 diagnoses. Now we will move on to procedures, again, as a level set. Here, boy, ICD-10 is completely different. It's, it's gone to 
um, a taxonomy of procedures so that you're a multi-dimensional um, uh, taxonomy representing what the approach was, um, what body system was involved, um, whether there were graphs, et cetera. So um, ICD-10 really looks different from ICD-9 in SNOMED. And you can see that in that second example where there's one ICD-9 code for open reduction of fracture of tibia and fibula. There's one SNOMED code and multiple ICD-10 codes, which break it down in sort of the granular components that, that um, uh, are involved in those procedures. So PCS uh, is an oddball, and, and we've got to get used to coding in PCS. Again, um, better coding there uh, is going to make a big impact on, on revenue and quality. So with that level set, again, I know that was a review for, for some of you. I'm now going to uh, uh, give it over to Deborah to um, talk a little bit more detail about um, how this will benefit your organization. Well, thank you, Steve. And hello, everybody. Thank you for your time today. This is Deborah Szymanski. Now, let's take a closer look at financial risk in ICD-10. And a good way to identify this financial risk is by using analytics software. Take your historical 837i claim and simulate 837i claims with ICD-10 code. Through this predictive modeling, you are able to identify where there are DRG shifts, identify why these shifts are occurring, and most importantly, what to do to prevent the shift. Begin your analysis by looking at high risk, high volume, high dollar DRG shifts. Again, easily identified through analytic software. Validate and categorize your risk. At Health Language, we have developed a claims analysis methodology. We have identified three reasons why DRGs can shift. One, true financial risk. Two, due to new coding guidelines. And three, new documentation requirements. I will discuss each of these three categories in greater detail later in the presentation. And as you begin to understand why the DRGs have shifted, turn this insight into meaningful action. Tailor and customize your CDI program and coding education program. Identify charts for dual coding and review. Make your time count. All right, so where do you start? Hospitals have thousands to tens of thousands of 837i claims. You need to focus your efforts, and this can be done using analytic software. Typically, our clients review 6 to 12 months of historical 837i data. We have found that on average, about 10% of the claims shift. This is good news, as 10% is a manageable amount for review. However, if you do not use analytic software, there is a 90% chance you are reviewing the wrong data. Again, make your time count. All right, Julie, launch, launch the first polling question, please. So as mentioned, at Health Language, we have developed a claims analysis methodology. Three categories identifying why DRG shifts. This methodology allows for repeatability and reliability amongst the coding analysts. It also turns insights into meaningful action. So let's go through each one of these categories. The first category is financial. This is where you have true financial risk, true increases or decreases in the DRG weight. For example, where you lose or gain a CC or MCC. Also, we are seeing decreases in the DRG weight with certain ICD-10 codes, regardless of the specificity of documentation or selection of the most precise I-10 code. And I'll show some detailed examples of each one of these categories in the next week, a few slides. The second category is coder education. What do the coders need to know in ICD-10 that is specific to your hospital? Where are there one-to-many relationships amongst the ICD-10 codes? can be challenging when a coder has to, to select a code in this new coding set. What coding guidelines, ICD-10 codes, and service lines should be reviewed, uh, reviewed before October 1st, 2015? The last category, CDI, I would like to say check documentation immediately. Where, what areas of documentation need to be improved to ensure the selection of the most specific ICD-10 code? Identify what charts need to be reviewed for documentation. Customize CDI training by provider and inform each provider what they need to know to be successful in the transition to ICD-10. Right? And ultimately, update the EMR to help remind providers what they need to document uh, for ICD-10. So I like to say the better the template, the better the documentation. The better the documentation, the better the coding. The better the coding, the better the revenue. Okay. So let's look at a claims analysis project. 
Here we have taken historical 837i claims and simulated ICD-10 claims. We now begin to understand where the DRG shifts are occurring. On this graph, the red shows potential decreases and the blue shows potential increases. Once we determine the where, the coding analysts can then drill down to the claim level detail to understand the why. Um, is everyone able to see the slides? We had a, a note from one of the attendees that uh, things were stuck in the poll and that the slides were not showing. Oh, thank you, Steve. The, um, the poll is now closed, so the slides should be flowing through correctly now. Okay. Yeah, we'll get, well, I'm sorry about that, but we'll wait a few minutes there for the next poll. So, what we're looking at here now, we've drilled down to the claim level detail. And on the left hand, uh, on the left side is the historical 837i claim. The DRG is 885 and the DRG weight is 0 0.9539. On the right-hand side is the simulated ICD-10 claim, and we can see that the DRG is now 881, and the DRG weight has decreased to 0 0.6356. Right, so we need to ask ourselves, why did this shift occur? In the I-9 claim, the principal diagnosis is major depressive disorder unspecified degree. The ICD-10 code, major depressive disorder single episode unspecified, is causing the DRG uh, shift to decrease, and the DRG, uh, the DRG to shift, and the DRG a way to decrease. We see this quite often. Unspecified codes as a principal diagnosis cause the DRG weight to decrease. The whole point of I-10 is specificity. So what can be done to prevent this shift? If we look at the F32 major depressive disorder codes in I-10, in order to avoid selecting the unspecified code, severity of illness is required. This is a very common theme in ICD-10 severity of illness, mild, moderate, or severe. By replacing the unspecified I-10 code with a more specific code, the DRG shift is neutralized. All right, great, so what? What do I do with this information? Well, using the claims analysis methodology discussed earlier, we would categorize the shift as CDI and use this information to inform the CDI program. What providers are documenting major depressive disorder? And moving forward, we need to capture severity of illness. So inform our providers that based on their clinical findings, please document mild, moderate, or severe. Let's update the templates to, buy, uh, to drive better documentation. And coders, you know, please query the providers if this information is not present. All right, Julie, launch the second polling question, please. Okay. So I'll pause here. Uh, we'll launch the polling question, pause for any questions, and then we'll go into some detailed examples of those three categories. So the second question is, select what strategies can be used to mitigate financial risk in ICD-10. Please select all that apply. DDI, tailoring message to different specialties, coder education, contract remediation, and or APR DRG. Okay, we have 83, 85, 88%, 90% of the attendees have responded. We'll give it just a few more seconds. Okay, polling is now closed with 92% of the people voting. Great, thank you. So again, well, let's take a look at some of the uh, specific examples from the three categories I had just discussed. All right, so let's take a look at financial. And these examples I'm showing you today were created by using the MSD or G Grouper version 31. So as we can see here, uh, our I9 DRG was 945, and it's 949 in ICD-10. We've gone from a rehabilitation with CCMCC to an aftercare code. And our DRG weights have gone from a 1.3204 to a 0 
So the VTO is no longer exist in ICD-10, right? We don't have these specific rehabilitation codes. We're uh, in in ICD-10, we need to use our aftercare codes. They can cause the DRGs to change, and oftentimes we see the DRG weight to decrease. This is also coming from uh, the uh, rehab codes being a primary diagnosis. So you need to ask yourself, how are your hospitals paying rehab claims today? How are they currently reimbursed? Are they per diem or DRG? We are seeing decreases in the DRG weight with the I-10 aftercare codes, as we see in this example. In fact, several of our clients are in discussions with their payers and plan to change from DRG-based payments to a per diem. Okay. Our next example is coder education. So again, it's a decrease, and we see we've gone from a DRG of 247 in ICD-9 to 251 in ICD-10. The DRG weight of a 1.9911 to a 1.9237 in ICD-10. So it's not a huge decrease, but a decrease nonetheless. It's quite a common procedure in many facilities. So if we add up a bunch of these procedures and we've taken a hit in our DRG weight, it's certainly going to cause us some uh, problems financially. So this is a procedure code. And in ICD-9, we need quite a few codes to um, identify the different components of the PCTA procedure. So the good news in 10 is it's identified now in one procedure code, a combinatorial code. But if you look down here, these codes are quite confusing. Like it's a, two, a 02733ZZ <laughs> to a 02734ZZ. Right? It's very easy to transpose a number or a letter resulting in the wrong code, and each one of these have a very specific meaning. In addition, we're finding that if the device used is non-drug eluding, we take a hit in our DRG. Right, so we have to document what we're doing. This is important information to know. In addition to understanding the, the device and whether it's drug eluding or not, we also need to ensure our documentation supports and our coders understand how many sites, one through four, single vessel versus bifurcation, again, the type of stent or the approach. Now, given that this is a percutaneous procedure, you also have the option to select open approach. So if a coder selects the open approach, and this is going to be immediately kicked back by the pair, as it says here, it's a percutaneous approach, right? So very important information for our coders to know when we move forward with ICD-10. And then lastly, our CDI example, and we saw this one earlier, in the 885 to the 881, we saw our decrease in our DRG wave from a 0 0.9539 to a 0 0.6356, right? This is that major depressive disorder. I showed this example earlier. It demonstrates the importance of selecting the most specific ICD-10 code, as the shift can be mitigated by more specificity. Now, below is data from a multi-site hospital system we're currently working with. If you look at the third blue line, it shows how one hospital facility could potentially lose over a million dollars if the unspecified code is selected. Right? That's over one million dollars with this one example. So the message to providers, based on your clinical findings, includes severity of illness. So when the payment rate is $6,000, this becomes a $2,000 word, all right? One word could ne negatively affect your payment. All right. So I'll pause and see if there's any questions. All right. <laughs> Steve, there so are no questions on. at this time. All right, thank you. All right, so we've reviewed where there is risk in the inpatient setting via the 837i claim. Now, what about the clinic? What about the ER, right? I'm an ER nurse. What about what? How can we prepare for ICD-10? Yeah, looking at maybe our 837p claim. So the good news, the CPA, uh, excuse me, CPT is not changing. However, the documentation will need to support the specificity required to capture the most precise ICD-10 diagnosis and procedure codes. Last year, sorry, the diagnosis codes. One way to approach CDI training for the clinics and ER is to identify the top unspecified I-9 diagnosis codes. And the question to ask is, were these codes selected because of limitations within I-9? Does the current documentation support the specificity required in ICD-10? And what do the providers and coders need to know about I-10 specific to their practices, specific to their service life? So here we have an example of an I-9 unspecified report. 
This report, this report shows a provider's current top I-9 unspecified code. And it will help us identify documentation and coding requirements for ICD-10. See, the thought is, if you have unspecified an I-9 today, right, you're, it's most likely you're going to have the unspecified an I-10. It's a great place to start our training, identify where we have risk, and how we need to formulate our CDI program and our, our coding education. All right, Julie, if you'd like to launch that third polling question. Okay, the third question is, what are some disruptions in revenue cycle expected in ICD-10? Please select all that apply. Increase in AR days, increase in clinician queries, increase in denials, decrease in coder productivity, and or all of the above. Looks like most everyone has voted, but we'll keep it open for a few more seconds. Okay, voting is now closed, and here are the results. All right. Okay, so now we ask ourselves, you know, so what? What, what am I going to do with all this information? Well, if you do not understand where you have financial risk in ICD-10, how do you know what areas will be impacted? How do you know how to plan your remediation efforts? Right? We need to leverage analytics to understand where there are true increases and decreases. This information will help when discussing contracts with payers and planning our budgets. Two, we need to target trainer coding. Many coders will attend an ICD-10 training course, but what specifically needs to be reviewed before October 2015? What diagnosis codes, procedure codes will be problematic for your hospital? Review by service lines specific to your facility. Justify your coding education expenses. If your coders are not properly trained, you're putting yourself at great risk. Also identify the need for additional coding staff. When we go live with ICD-10, research has shown that we're going to have to take a hit in our coder productivity. This will allow us to justify those additional FTEs. Make your time count. A random chart review will not provide you with the best information. Focus your efforts on the high risk, high volume, high dollar amount areas and identified by analytics software. Then information obtained from a chart review will inform your CDI program. Customize this by a provider. Tell them exactly what they need to know to be successful in ICD-10. Decrease those dreaded queries. <laughs> this ultimately improves coder productivity and our AR time. And lastly, looking under the hood today, are there areas that can be improved upon now? Use extra time to assess financial risk and improve your bottom line today. So we have one more polling question. So Julie, if you'd like to launch that fourth polling question. Okay. The last question, unspecified codes as a principal diagnosis often decrease the DRG weight. Please select one. True, false, not applicable, does not apply to me. Okay, we've got 89% of the attendees voting. We'll leave it on for just a couple more seconds. Okay, voting is now closed. And the results are 76% true, 12% false, 12% does not apply to me.
Back to you, Deborah. All right, thank you, Julie. So with that, we'll see if there's any questions. Uh, we're about ready to end our presentation for today. If you have a question, please um, feel free to type it in under the questions section, and I will read it off to the collective group. Last call for questions. Okay, Deborah, it appears we do not have any questions at this time. All right, thank you, Julie. And thank you, everyone, for your time today. Now that we have given you, a, what, 25 minutes back to your days, you can go start those remediation efforts for ICD-10. Take, take this extra time to prepare. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Cummins. Again, thank you, everyone, for your time today. Thank you, Deborah and Steve. Great job. Uh, hopefully, you guys found that some value in that discussion, at least some food for thought. I know a lot of you have done some work already. Some may be halfway down the plan. Some may have not started. Uh, so we just wanted to plant some seeds and give you some ideas of directions where you might could focus. And obviously, Health Language is here to help answer questions if you need. My contact information is on the screen. My phone number is 615-739. 4532. And for those in attendance today, Health Language will be offering a complimentary claims analysis using your ICD-9 data. I will reach out to you as a follow-up um, to give you more details on this if you're interested. What we found is many of the clients who've done work already have taken us up on this claims analysis, and it's either validated the work they've already done thus far or really highlighted some additional areas that might need attention. So look for me for a follow-up. Feel free to reach out if you have specific questions for me or the team, and thank you again for your time today. Thank you very much.